Well, hello, family. It's good to, good to see you. Good to know that you're there. If you're online, thank you for, for being with us. Thank you for being with us on online.church. Uh, if you've joined us from previously being on Facebook, thank you for being here. We're so glad that we get to participate in, in worship together. Uh, thank you to those of you who are in person. We've got some babies in the room. I'm excited about that. Um, I, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Eddie. I am the lead pastor here at Grace Covenant Church Sterling, and it is a pleasure to be with you. Uh, before we get into the word, I just wanted to say a few things. Um, first of all, thank you to everyone who participated in our, our collection. We went two weeks ago, and we delivered to a number of different neighborhoods in, in Sterling our, our Grace Covenant Church uh, grocery bags with some information, letting people know that they could donate canned goods and other non-perishable items, uh, really, and, and we would collect this past Saturday. Now, we went ahead and did that, and to those of you who took part in that, thank you so much. We collected over 5,000 pounds of stuff, and I think that's at least a ton. Is it 2,000 or 4,000? So, 2,000? So, over two tons of food. It's a, that's a lot of food. So great job uh, to those of you who are online. Thank you so much if you took part in that. We, we, our heart and our desire is to be um, a blessing to our community. And we're able to do that because of your generosity. And because of that, we've been able to replenish some of the, the food pantries in the area. Now, our upcoming, our next upcoming outreach, school's coming up and, and, and people are, are getting ready and, or they have already gotten ready, parents have gotten ready, but we are doing a school supply drive and, and so if you're interested in that, if you'd like to take part in that, we would love for you to do so. You can text our, our text line 474747 with the word outreach, and we will give you all the information that you need to, to be a part of that. Again, if you're listening online, you can, you can join us by texting uh, outreach to 474747, and we will get you connected. Now, finally, something really exciting. I know that you guys are going to love this. We have our fall corporate fast coming up uh, this first week of September. <laughs> Give it up for the corporate fast. People are like, uh, okay. But this is really, a, this is a moment for us to, to engage our faith, to trust that God is going to meet us in what I believe to be, it's going to be a unique season. It's going to be a very unique season. If you're a parent, you hear what I mean when I say unique. It's euphemistic for some other things. But uh, God is going to meet us, and we're going to pray and believe that he's going to meet us in this season of life, that he's not, we're not just going to survive, but we're going to thrive and grow. And so I would encourage you, it's, it's uh, September tw- uh, 2nd through the 4th, so do what you can. If you've never fasted, don't go just straight water. You do a little search on the internet about, well, or talk to a, a leader about fasting in a, in a safe way. Talk to your doctor about fasting in a safe way. Uh, There are a number of different things that you can do to engage your faith. The purpose of fasting is not just to not eat, but it's in order that you might stir up your soul to recognize your spiritual need. It's in order to bring attention to the fact that that maybe we don't engage with God as much as we ought to, and it gives us opportunity and a reminder and, and time, if we're not eating a meal, it gives us time to pray. And so would you join me in that? It's going to be a fruitful moment Whenever we fast, God moves uniquely. He, he cares about our commitment to him. Not to say that our commitment is, is the ultimate determining factor in things, but he does, he has an interest in seeing us being committed. And so please consider taking part in that. Uh, we'll break the fast on that Friday at 7.15, and there will be a service in our Chantilly location. The same sort of rules apply. We'll, we'll, we'll pre-register, and there will be uh, masks that we ask that you to wear and, and for you to social distance. But it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be an impactful moment. Well, over the, over the last few weeks, I have been going through our, our mission statement for Grace Covenant Church. And for, for any organization that really wants to, to keep things aligned along a, a purpose, whether it's a, it's a for-profit organization that has the goal of, of bringing in revenues and making a profit, or it's a, a non-profit that's intended to reach certain metrics and, and do certain things and accomplish certain things, there is a mission that we ascribe to. And at Grace Covenant Church, Sterling, Chantilly, uh, all of the locations, our mission is that we want to help people encounter Christ, 
through the word, through the preached word, through small group ministry, through all the things that we do, we want to help people encounter Christ, experience biblical community, community that's centered around God, that's united in Christ, that's empowered by the spirit, that reflects the, the multi, multi uh, aspected way that we are people. Um, we want to experience biblical community and we want to extend this kingdom. And for us specifically, we want to extend along the, extend along the Route 7 corridor. So that's who we are as a people. We want to help people encounter Christ, experience community, and extend the kingdom. And that is a great mission statement, but it is not an ultimate mission statement. It's, it's not an ultimate mission statement. You know, one of the things that I like about kids is that they are really good at asking hard questions. They, they have no problem, and, and they look at life in such a way that a lot of times the things that we ignore or we don't think about because we've kind of relegated them to, well, I don't need to know about that, or, or I don't know how to know about that, or um, I've never even considered that. You know, they'll just ask questions, you know. Well, why can't we live on Mars? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Like what? I mean, well, you know, honestly, I don't know. But, but I assume that there are reasons. You know, why? Why do we uh, use cars instead of bikes? Or why, why, does the sky, why is the sky blue? I mean, that's a pretty common one. And I used to think it was because of the oceans. And I had teachers that told me that. I had teachers that told me that that was because of the ocean. Then I've come to find out that it has something to do with the atmosphere and refraction and light and stuff. So it's not about the oceans being reflected. I don't know. So my teachers were just making it up as they went along as well. Um, but they ask good questions. And one of the questions you'll hear, sometimes you'll hear a kid ask is, is why? And so as we considered the, the mission statement, I want us to ask one more question. I want us to ask why? We want to help people encounter Christ, experience community, and extend this kingdom, but why? And, and in your own personal life, there are things and goals, there are, there are missions that you ascribe to, you know, as a, as a professional, as a, a parent, as a, a friend, as, as a spouse, as a child, there are th- goals that you have in your life of, I want to do this. And you can ask why, and that sometimes will get you a little bit further. And if you keep asking why, you come up to a place where there's an ultimate why behind all that you do. There's an ultimate why behind all that you do. Now, we don't always think about that ultimate why. We don't always, we don't always consider it explicitly, but there is something behind all these things that's motivating what we do. And so I want us to look at Scripture and see what Scripture has to say about what our ultimate why is. And my conviction is that Scripture is going to tell us that we do all these things and we ought to do all these things so that we might bring glory to God. So we're going to read out of Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. So if you will stand with me, if you're online, you can still read with me. I'd love for you to do that. It's good for your soul and good for mine. We're going to stand together and read... Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and give it to, give it, I'm sorry, it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others and it gives light to all in the house, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would help us to to see, uh, to appreciate, and to, to, to grasp tightly our ultimate why. The why that stands behind all other whys. The the question of why do I do this that stands before before all other reasons. The thing that, that, that stands as a foundation on which we stand. God, I pray that your spirit would open our eyes to see that we were made for something glorious. That we were made for something uh, Significant but not significant or glorious as the world defines, but glorious and significant as you define. That in the, the, the common things that you've put in our lives to do, the good works that you've put in front of us to accomplish, that in that there is a way for us to do those things that it brings attention, it brings focus, it brings 
uh, interest, it brings light to who you are, and in that way it glorifies you. God, I pray that we would be a people whose goal, whose ultimate end, whose ultimate why is to glorify you as we enjoy you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this is, this is Matthew, thank you, you can be seated. This is Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, and this falls in line with what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus has gone up on a hill, and he's, he's preaching and teaching, and, and there's a lot of really uh, directional teaching here. A lot of this is how you ought to live in. And it's an amazing sermon because it lays out a kind of lifestyle and, and a set of beliefs that, that show us a way of living that is counter to what the world would suggest we ought to live like. He describes how he expects his disciples to live. I mean, if you were to go back and, and look at verses one and following, we see that, that we, we are expected to live in a way that we recognize our need for God. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That description of those who are poor in spirit is those who recognize their need. You know, we are expected to live in a way that we mourn loss, that we mourn loss of life. We mourn with those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall, shall be comforted. We're expected to, to keep our strength under control. We're supposed to live life in such a way that we're, we're using our strength in a controlled manner. Blessed are the meek. And he goes on. Blessed are those who seek godliness, who are merciful, who are wholly devoted to God, who seek peace with others who endure persecution for the sake of Christ. This is, this is what Jesus is, is, is giving us as, as a rubric for life, a rubric for character, a rubric for, for how he expects his disciples to live. And so he, he gives this sketch of what it looks like to live what we call under lordship. One of the values of Grace Covenant Church, one of the, the things that we hold tightly to besides our mission is this idea of lordship, that if Jesus is Lord, if he's in charge, if he is king, then we live under his authority and we must follow his rules and obey his commands and live as he desires us to live. And so here Jesus is saying, if I'm the Lord of your life, this is the way that I expect for you to live. And in fact, this is the way you should live if you want to be blessed. He gives us this sketch of, of what it looks to, like to live un, under lordship. Now, from this, from this description, he moves on to our identity and purpose, to what I've been talking about, this idea of a why, why we ought to live a particular way. So we're going to look at three different things. We're going to look at the source of our ultimate purpose. We're going to look at the nature of this purpose. And we're going to look at the end or the goal of this purpose. We'll look at the source of the purpose, the nature of this purpose, and the end of the purpose. First, let's consider the source of our purpose. Where do we, where do we get this purpose? Where do we find out what our ultimate why is? Look at verse 14 with me. You are the light of the world. Jesus is declaring something to you and me. Jesus is telling something to you and me. This isn't a discussion, right? This isn't, uh, you know, when I was in uh, sixth grade, we had Padea. Did it, has anyone else had Padea? If you had Padea online, uh, just say I had Padea or raise your hand. If you didn't, they, they joined our social studies and our English class, and we would read literature, and we were expected to take notes in the literature and write down our thoughts and highlight, you know, what's the point? What, is the, what are they trying to say? What's the argumentation? And then we would move our chairs into a big circle and have this Socratic meeting of minds where we, our teacher would ask us questions and we would converse. And, and Billy would have an opinion and Janice would have an opinion and neither Billy nor Janice were in my class but pretend like they were. And, and they would express their opinions and there was no wrong, there was no right, there was just a discussion with, with cogent, cogent arguments and the hope that we would all come to a greater level of truth in the process. That is not what Jesus is doing. He's not inviting us to a conversation He's not saying, what do you think? Why don't you tell me how I should lead you? What should I expect of this relationship? No, he says, you are the light of the world. And that's, it's a positive thing, but it's a positive thing that he is saying to us that we should receive and accept and live in light of. 
You see, the source of your purpose and my purpose is not our own deepest, greatest desire in our heart. Now, God does place desires in our heart, and certainly we are to, to live in line with those desires, but only insofar as those desires line up with his revealed word in Scripture. He is telling us these things because God is the source. Now, that's, that's, that's not in vogue. That's not popular, in, especially in a world where the only thing that's wrong to say is to say that there's something wrong. Jesus has a very clear idea of what's right and what's wrong and what's expected of your life and my life. And, and before we push towards any sort of ultimate goal of life, we have to recognize that we are not the ones who determine what that goal is. You don't get to decide what your ultimate life's goal is. Now, that doesn't mean that, you, you know, you, you can't decide, should I go to UNC Chapel Hill? Should I go to George Mason? Should I go to James? That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the essence of who you are and what that essence is, is intended to accomplish in creation. Now, there may be different ways that we do that. You know, there, there are a lot of different flavors of ice cream, but ice cream is supposed to be sweet and delicious and cold. Whatever flavor it is, it's going to be sweet and delicious and cold, unless it's, you know, actually, I can't think of a flavor I don't like. Don't tell me if you know. But we, we are made as people, and, and God is the decider. Um, you know, it, it, the, the challenge with this is, is a lot of times we get this wrong. And, and I, I remember when I graduated high school, our, our, I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe our song, our senior song was Listen to Your Heart. And it was Listen to Your Heart. No, that's not the right, that's not the right, that's a different song. But it was something along the lines of listening to your heart. And it was just, it was garbage. Like telling an 18 year old who has no idea what he's doing with his life to listen to his heart is like, it's like giving a kid a knife and say, figure it out. No, don't listen to your heart. Talk to someone older and wiser and smarter. And, and, and ultimately talk to the one who, who not only maybe has an idea of what your life is supposed to look like, but created you. When I was in fourth grade, I had a teacher and she would have us write our vocabulary out three times per word with the definition. You know, you'd write your word abacus, and you know, an abacus is a, you know, an ancient calculator, whatever. And then uh, arithmetic, arithmetic is math. And, and you, you'd have to write the word out, spell it correctly, three times with the uh, definition. And the danger was, and for those of you who are younger or online, or I mean, just because you're online, but not necessarily, but you had to write this out on what's called paper. And there were lines, and it was, it's made from the pulp of, of, of trees. And uh, you could use what's called a pencil, which is it's a, it's a piece of wood with some, another thing in it called lead. And the lead, it, it gets rubbed off onto the paper, and you write these symbols very similar to emojis. But uh, the, you put those symbols together, and they come, they, words happen. And, and you'd write these things, and she wanted it in an alphabetical order. And I invariably would do a great job, but if I messed up at all, and especially if I messed up at the beginning, I'd have to redo the whole thing. It would all be off, right? If I get arithmetic, then abacus, and then I go down the list and I get to, you know, uh, Xena, warrior, princess, I, and I realize, oh no, uh, this is bad. I have messed up arithmetic and abacus, I would have to throw out that piece of paper. There was no copy and paste. There was no, you know, cut, move it down. I just had to have a cramp in my hand for the next 45 minutes as I rewrote the whole thing. And I, I say that to you because if we don't get our purpose right, we are in danger of getting down the line in terms of life and coming to a place where we look back and we say, oh no, I have to erase it all. However, unlike Unlike my, my fourth grade self who did have some extra loose leaf paper, we don't get to go back and relive the, the 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years of life that we, we lived out of alignment with God's purpose. Now, that's not to say there isn't grace for God. I mean, certainly there is, and we can see in the, in the Bible that God uses people and, and engages their life at different stages. And that, um, I mean, if, it, you know, if you're freaking out, Moses was, f what, 40 or 80? He was old. He was older. 
40 is not old, 80 is old. Unless you're 80, then it's not old. I'm moving on. Uh, he, he, he started out later. Abraham was as good, the Bible says he was as good as dead. So he did start a little bit later. Um, but, but the reality is if we don't get this right, if we don't understand the source, if we don't figure out and align ourselves to the source of our purpose, the rest of this stuff won't make sense. Jesus determines, determines our purpose. So, so what is it? What is the purpose? Let's look, look further. It says this, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people gather, or sorry, light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. And it goes on, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is heaven. The nature of our purpose is, is he uses this, this picture of a light, this, this picture of a lamp, right? A city on a hill that, that draws your eye, that there's a tension brought to it. You know, imagine traveling down a dark road, around, and this is Jesus' time, right? There aren't street lights. There aren't, you know, there's no city lights. The, the, the light pollution is, is negated. So you can see the stars, but, but you're traveling and you see your destination up on the hill and you see the light and it's, it's drawing you in and, and you can, you can it's, a, it's a pointer, it's a, it's a compass, it's, it's an orienting landmark. The city on a hill draws us in. We can, it allows us to see things clearly, right? Uh, light allows us to see things clearly. If this, if this service was in the dark, it'd be a very different service. For those online, it would be a podcast. It would be audio only. Um, it, it helps us to see our surroundings, right? He says that we're a light, and part of what we're doing is helping the world to see its surroundings. You know, my kids are of the age that they like Legos, and that's great. And sometimes in the middle of the night, they wake up. And, and so I go and help them, you know, with whatever it is, and the blanket fell off, or, you know, I'm having a weird dream, or, you know, whatever. And there's a huge difference between Eddie walking in a dark room without a, an iPhone and Eddie walking in a dark room with an iPhone. And the difference is the difference between um, life and death by Danish engineering that is a Lego in my foot, right? The, and if you've ever, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny joke until it happens to you and you realize how terrible it is. Uh, but Legos are, they're, they're square and they're pointy and they have a lot of uh, corners and it's really beneficial to have a light to see your surroundings so you don't die a million, a million deaths on a, you know, six by two block of Lego. Um, not only can we see our surroundings as light, but we can see the source of light. Now, how many of you, you would, when you were younger, would draw landscapes? And I don't mean like fancy landscapes. I'm, I mean like you had four, you had the six color crayon. You drew the green horizon, which is, and maybe three sprigs, for, for, you know, three sprigs here, three sprigs here, and that's your grass. You get a sense of grass. And what would you do for the sun? You draw a circle in the corner, and you do either, you know, if you're a boy, you do, you know, four or five lines, and if your girl is like squiggly lines and squiggly, and like pink heart, smiley face, you know, whatever. But, but that was your sun. You drew the sun, and it was always a circle of some sort, and then lines emanating from it. And what's funny about that is it, it speaks to what we're intended to be. We are light, and part of what we do as light is we point to the sun. I'll say that again. We are light, and part of what we are to do is point to the sun. The sun would look a little bit strange if, if it was just the, the, you know, a, a yellow smile in the, in the sky. You'd be like, well, that's kind of, is it a moon? Is it... You know, a disembodied stick figure, what is it? But, but something about the rays of light help you see, oh, it's a source of light. And if God is the circle, we are the lines drawing our own eyes and drawing other people's eyes up to God. And in this text, Jesus uses this metaphor of light to refer back to our good works. Look at uh, verse 16 with me. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see what? Your good works and then give glory to God. He's, he's saying that we are intended to, to be light, and how are we to be light? But by our good works. I don't know if you, you listened on last Wednesday, but I preached on another uh, passage in Titus about God's good works for us. And, and our good works are intended to confirm something about who we are in Christ. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 
Verse 10, something that, you know, a a, a chapter or a verse that I would encourage you to memorize, Paul tells us this. He says, um, we are his workmanship, and the word there is craftsmanship. We are his we are his creation. We are his, you know, he's labored over us. He's thought about us. He's, he's, he's wanted to shape us. We are his craftsmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You and I were made to, to do good things and in so doing, be light. Be the kind of light that, that lights the surroundings around people. They begin to see how life ought to be. They begin to see how creation should function. They begin to see what love ought to look like. They begin to see what kindness and generosity and patience ought to look like. They, they begin to see what relationships ought to function like. And our good works, are, they're intended to point people to God so that they see, oh, this, this is something that shows me the way back to the source of light. He shows us the source and the nature that we are to, to do good works. And, and, and family, this isn't, this isn't rocket science. Sometimes we hear good works and we think, okay, how, you know, I, I can't even graduate college. How, how am I going to build a, a huge legacy? But, but he's saying there, there are things that I've placed in your life. You know, husbands, wives, your good works, many of them are loving your spouse in a way that honors God and not doing the other thing that you want to do that doesn't honor honor God. Parents, part of what what good works are, are are loving your child sacrificially, being forgiving towards that child, being giving towards that child when that child deserves other things. You know, uh, those of you who live in the corporate environment, good works are living and acting and, 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 and moving with integrity, doing your job in such a way that it, it shows that you are honorable and that you, you operate with a higher level of, of ethics. You know, uh, neighbors, doing good works means being a good neighbor, not being loud, not being obnoxious, not doing things that, that force other people to feel frustration, anger, like you don't care or love them. It's, it's not complicated. Now, there are some grand good works, and some of you will walk in things that, that involve larger amounts of money or larger amounts of time or more people, and, and certainly those are good works that we all can participate in, but, but the good works that God calls us to are not, it's not complicated and it's not mystical. He calls us to things, and he makes it clear in his word. I mean, even in this, in this sermon, he says, you know, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who mourn, who are meek, who are hungry and thirst for thirsty for righteousness, who are merciful. These are all aspects of good works. He calls us to these. But he's not satisfied with just showing the source and the nature of our purpose. He, he wants to get us to the ultimate end of our purpose. Verse 16 says this, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works, and I'm gonna add a word, and, and therefore give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, I'm not adding a word because I think that I should improve the Bible. I'm adding that word because I think that's, that's the, the force of what Jesus is saying there. He's saying, you should do these work, good works, and therefore, in that way, you should give glory, uh, uh, others will give glory to God who is in heaven. We were made to bring glory to God. I read this to our worship team on Thursday, but I'm gonna read it and we'll be done very soon. In Psalm chapter 19, it says this, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night reveals knowledge. And it goes on to describe how creation reveals the nature of God. And in a sense, creation worships God. And by that I mean creation reflects the glory of God to everything else around it. Frogs worship God. I don't know how, like I don't get it, but slugs worship God. There's something about a slug that it's living in in integrity with the purpose that God has made it for, and it's doing the things that it's supposed to do, and in doing what it's supposed to do, it brings glory to its creator. You and I were made to bring glory 
to God, but not only because he is our creator, but also because he is our father. Again, in Ephesians chapter one, verse five, it says that we've been predestined to what? Adoption, that he has prepared us for adoption, that he doesn't just call us sinners who've been saved, but sons and daughters who've been brought into his family. And as such, we are called to bring him glory, not only as our creator, but as our daddy, as our father. We represent him. You know, my sons and my daughter, they, they have the name Barnes, and what they do represents something about who the Barnes are. We tend to be kind of loud and a little rambunctious and very silly. We make face, I know, I don't know if you know, we are silly. Um, there are a lot of pictures of me and my daughter making faces. That's something we do. It's a family value. We love babies. We hang out with babies. We, we love to hold babies and, and tickle babies and and. and my, my daughter, she, she loves to hold, ba- but my sons do too because that's a family value. That's, that's who we are. And you and I, we are sons and daughters of Jesus or of God the Father, younger brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And as such, we are to glorify God. We are supposed to bring positive attention to our family. Our good, good works are not the end. The danger in, in your life and my life is not that we will... will the, the, we could avoid shipwrecking our life, doing horribly immoral things, and still miss our purpose by living good, quiet, moral lives that disregard the fact that we are called to glorify God. We can, we can be good citizens, patient people, morally upstanding, and if, if our end is not to say, God is the source, Jesus is my savior, God is the one who empowers me to do this, then we miss the ultimate end. The point isn't good works. The point is the son, right? Again, to think about that picture that we all drew. If, if we drew the, the rays without the sun itself, it would look weird. Now it's a kid picture, so maybe it looks weird anyways. But, but the rays are not intended to, to be them them, they're themselves. They're intended to point back to, to draw your eye up to the source. And, and your good works and my good works are intended to bring people to see and know and appreciate God. And if we don't keep this straight in our heads, we will seek to bring other things glory besides God. We, we are glory we're glorifiers, we're worshipers. We are made to bring glory to something. And if we don't bring it to God, we will bring it to something else. And in fact, if you were to read through, um, there's another text that I was looking at, 1 Corinthians 10. Paul talks a great deal about how uh, the, the church there was, was interacting with idols and eating and drinking and, and whether or not they should eat food sacrificed to idols. And, and I'm not trying to open that whole can of worms, but he says, you know, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, you need to do it to the glory of God. And the problem was they were doing it to the glory of something else. And whenever you don't do something to the glory of God, you're doing it to the glory of something else. We are called, or the end of our purpose, the, the ultimate goal, the biggest why is to do good works for God's glory. You were made for this. You online, you were made for this. You were made for this. Little ones, you were made for this. Kids, you were made for this. You were made to make God look awesome. You were made to be a bright yellow ray of light that points to the smiling sun. That's what you've been made for. The point is to bring attention to the source of the good works. So what is your purpose? When you think about your mission statement, maybe maybe you have a personal mission statement. Have you thought far enough to say, okay, well, I want to be a benefit to all the people, and that's why I have this business. But have you asked the question, well, why do I want to be a benefit to help people? Is it because I have a desire to, to, to find fulfillment in my activities and my success? Or is it because I want to bring glory to the God who's given me the ability to do these things? You know, I want to be a good husband or a good wife. Why Do you want... To, to feel completed in a person or do you want to serve this person in the same way that Christ serves the church and the church serves Christ and therefore reflect God's glory to your spouse and those around you? What is your ultimate purpose? If you feel like you, you haven't tapped into this, my encouragement is you can start today. 
And if you haven't trusted in Jesus and, and you feel, you've heard me talk about, you know, well, getting down the road and, and, and realizing you, you really have not lived for God and you've lived for yourself, my encouragement is that God does have more loose leaf paper. And you could, you could turn from your sins, you could turn from bringing glory to other things, whether it's yourself or uh, other, another person or another activity or another job, and you can say, I want to turn away from everything I know to be idolatry, worshiping and bringing glory to other things, and I want to worship and bring glory to God in my life. I want to trust Jesus who made that possible through his life, death, and resurrection on the cross in my place for my sins, and you can, you can have a new piece of paper and begin to write out your words correctly. <laughs> Live out your purpose before God. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you love us. And I thank you that you give us purpose. And I thank you that that purpose informs all that we do and it allows us to find real fulfillment. I pray that you would bless us and help us to live in, in, in line with what you've called us to do, to bring glory to the Father with our good works, to be, to be passionate about doing good works and to be passionate about letting those good works speak to how good you are. If, you, if you're in this room or if you're online and, and you have trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if today you've realized that you need to turn away from these other things that you've tried to bring glory to, whether it's yourself or something else, and you want to turn to God, you want to be forgiven of, of your sins and your disobedience, and you want to experience new life, then I just if you're online, let one of our hosts know. If you're here, we'd love to hear from you, but whatever you do, pray this with me. God, I, I wanna turn away from everything I know to be sin, everything I know to be me trying to bring glory to other things, and I wanna bring glory to you. I wanna live my life in line with you, under your lordship, believing and trusting in Jesus Christ as my Lord, as my savior. I wanna, I wanna live a new life in you. If that's you, please let us know because we'd love to help you walk that out. We'd love to help you grow in your, in your relationship with God and your relationship with other Christians. Amen. Well, family, it is good. It's good to be with you. And, and we are continuing to, to labor in this, in this season of life and we are continuing to try and love our community through our generosity. Those of you who, again, gave yesterday and, and, and earlier this week, thank you so much. And those of you who have been giving either through canned goods or non-perishable items or giving through offerings, thank you so much. I wanna come again today and give you another opportunity to partake in this work of generosity for the sake of Sterling and Loudoun County. Give you an opportunity to, to participate in this. If you'd like to give today, you can do so by writing a check and making it payable to Grace Covenant Church and writing uh, Sterling Benevolence in the, in the memo, or you can give on our website, gracecub.org slash sterling, or you can give through our mobile app. I believe if you're online, you can click the give button and that'll take you to the right place and you will write Sterling Benevolence in the, in the memo line or the other line. Uh, but I wanna encourage you that this is one of the means by which we uh, do good works for the sake of our community and the glory of God. So I'm gonna pray and, and ask God to bless this offering. God, I thank you for another opportunity to be a blessing to those who need your provision. And God, I pray that you would use this, that you would multiply this, this offering for your glory and the joy of the people who would experience it so that they might know you, follow you, serve you, and love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Well, family, it is good to be with you. Stand with me if you're online. Engage with me as we get ready to dismiss. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth to forevermore. Amen. Love you, family.